So today, we're concluding our series, The Unmanageable Life. Does your life feel more manageable now? Or have you found that you're a little bit more on edge, a little bit more irritable, a little bit more depressed, a little bit more checked out? I mean, we have to be honest. We are facing unprecedented times. I mean, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. We're facing a racial reckoning in our nation. We're in uncertain times economically. We're in a divisive election year. And so with all of this pressure, you're going to feel it. And cracks in your character might begin to become obvious. And not just for us. If you have children, you might even see how they're being affected by these days. I've had some parents tell me that their little one's personality seems to be changing because of lack of connection with others. And so that's why this series and the next one in this season is so important. We're looking at how the 12 steps, which has given freedom to many, many people with, with addictions to alcohol and drugs can actually help all of us. No matter what your area of struggle might be, no matter what wound you might have, these steps ripped from the pages of scripture can actually bring life and freedom and healing to all of us. There may be something in your life right now that, that you go to when you're stressed and you don't even realize how addictive it's been for you. After 22 years, I, I finally realized I had an addiction. It's an addiction to the cell phone. It started back in the late 90s with Nokia. Some of you might remember these phones. It even had a game on it called Snake. It was far more fun than it looks, I promise. But that really was just the beginning. It was, it was cool to be able to call other people, but it was actually in the early 2000s when I got a BlackBerry that things got really, really bad. I mean, look, it even has a keyboard. You, you could text, you could email anytime, anywhere. The problem with that is, I'm married and I have, at the time, two little kids. They didn't want me texting and emailing anytime, anywhere. In fact, oftentimes they would interrupt my work from home and try to get my attention. And, and even my wife would rebuke me and ask me to quit. And I would just say, don't worry, it's just a busy season. Or it's not that bad. I, I can still hear what you're saying. It got so bad that finally, at one point, what finally got my attention was when she said, if you're going to be working like this 24 seven, then I don't know if I want to be married to a pastor anymore. She was basically wanting me to either change my job or change my personality. And so I had a decision to make and I, and I asked her, just give me a year to show you that I can still live out my calling. And that includes being a good father and a good husband. And so she gave me that year, and we went through counseling, and we learned to communicate better. Crisis averted. And then Steve Jobs invented the iPhone. I mean, this was a game changer. Do you know how difficult it is not to look at your phone? I mean, our smartphone has access to the world. It's at our fingertips. And did you know that the iPhone is millions of times faster than the computer that actually guided the astronauts to the moon. And we have that in the palm of our hand. And actually, it's incredibly addictive. In fact, listen to what psychology today has to say about it. Your phone triggers happy chemicals by bringing good news and social support. The thought of your phone actually activates a pathway that flows to your happy chemicals. The problem is that soon, these chemicals are metabolized and you have to do more to get more. Even more haunting from this article, it says, our brain is not designed to release good feelings all the time for no reason. And how much more problematic is it for those children whose brains are still developing? So a couple years ago, I was given the gift of a sabbatical. And during that sabbatical, I decided I was gonna go offline my goal was six weeks. I was gonna pretend it was 1992. No texting, no email, no internet, not even pagers. And in that six weeks, I was just determined to not look at my phone. I was so excited. I even printed out the maps for the two cities that I was going to go and visit during the sabbatical. The problem is I kept cheating. 
Uh, that first week, I, I kept looking at my phone. See, one of the things that I got to right before we, I, I went on the sabbatical was Inbox Zero. Have you ever been there? It, it's, like, it's like Nirvana. No emails in your inbox. And so every night, I just could not help myself and just check my email just so I could delete everything that's come in. And finally, after a week of cheating, I got an email from Sulinda who had given permission to help me follow up with emails. And it said this, stop rechecking your email. And if you could go on to read the fine print, she basically threatens me that if I don't stop checking my email, she's going to actually change my password, which I did not think was fair. In fact, I was really angry. So I decided to, in that moment, try to work through those steps to get rid of the anger before I responded, because you're not supposed to respond to an email when you're angry. You're not even supposed to respond to an email when you're on sabbatical, but even still, I finally calmed down enough to thank her. Thank you for giving me the gift of some time off. Now, what's interesting is the moment I got off my phone, it was really actually quite difficult. I, I felt like I was missing something. I kept reaching for something that was not there. Other times I would notice that literally no matter where I was, I was the only person not on my phone. It was incredibly lonely at the mall or at the movie theater or at the airport. But even worse, I began to have these anxious and even dark thoughts. And what I began to realize is that what I'd been doing for 22 years was allowing my phone to be a distraction from reflection. I was letting my phone be a distraction from actually dealing with things that are internal. I was actually allowing the phone to become a distraction from God. And so in the end, I was able to be off the phone, the internet for five weeks. And you know what I discovered? I told my wife, I'm only going to watch television when you want to watch it, which I discovered is not very often. But in the midst of that, this lack of screen time, I actually experienced peace. I was able to work through those anxious feelings with God and with reflection and thought. I actually became incredible. On my reading list, I fixed the AC window unit. I even went through physical therapy after hurting my back, fixing the window AC unit. I got one kid registered for college. I got another other kid her driver's license it's amazing with all this time i also discovered rest in fact now we we try to take a, a Sabbath once a week just time away from the phone time away from the news just time connected with each other and with god what is it you go to when you're stressed where do you go when you had a, a long day? Is it something that you eat or smoke or watch or consume or drink? You see, all of us have something that we go to to distract us from what's really happening. And our hope is that in this season, you'll actually come out of this season stronger and healthier than you were going into it. And these steps just ripped from the scriptures can help heal whatever bad habit or wound you might have. Now, today we're talking about the two most difficult, step four and five. If you make it through four, you might quit before five, but a lot of people quit before four. I think that's why John gave them to me. They're the most difficult. But I want to review just very quickly steps one through three. We looked at these last few weeks. Step one, we admitted that we were powerless over name your issue and that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. If you missed any of these, I encourage you to go back and listen. You can find it online at our podcast. And so now steps in four, and you should understand that steps four and five are actually about finding peace with ourselves. And when we can find 
peace with God, as in steps one, two, and three, we're able to find peace with ourselves and extend that peace to others, which we'll be looking at in our next series. Step four, listen to this. We made a searching and fearless inventory of ourselves. Or step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Do you see why people give up on this? We don't like making an inventory. We don't like searching. We don't like being fearless, and we don't like admitting any wrong to anyone. But this step is critical to transformation. It's critical to become the person that God's created you to be. So let's look at these a little bit more in depth and even notice the biblical origins of these ideas, of the spiritual act of confession. Well, step four, we made a searching and fearless inventory of ourselves. This is being committed to self-awareness and taking personal responsibility. And in order to do that, you have to go back in order to go forward. Now, it's not in order to go back to blame others or to, to even become stirred up again about the past, but instead to be honest in order to acknowledge the impact of others' decisions on your life, as well as your own decisions on the lives of others. We can't go back and change things, nor can we control what's been done to us, but we can choose how we're going to move forward. See, the problem is we are where we are now because we dealt with those things the way we dealt with them. And now is our opportunity to look backwards with God and relive those moments, to re-experience them through his perspective, allowing him to bring healing and hope, even to our most painful moments of our past, to move us into the future. Now, as we've talked about before, we're all engaged in a spiritual battle. The scriptures use different language like light and darkness, like love and hate, or, or walking in step with the spirit versus giving in to the flesh. And Paul, who was someone who actually was transformed incredibly miraculously, someone who was persecuting even there when followers of Jesus were killed and then became a church planter, wrote these words to help those that were now following Jesus live out this new life. Look what he writes in Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ is set then and do not of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So which describes where you work or where you live more? Are you loving each other as you love yourself? Or are you biting and devouring each other? See, if we're not careful, we can just give in to this fatigue of being in the midst of all that we're going through. And we can sentiment to brew. We can become more annoyed. But the beautiful thing is we don't have to live that way. We don't have to go the path that's so destructive. See, the scripture's right here in this idea. It's not a giant don't do list. It's actually warnings that help us live the kind of life we long to live. And in this case, it's saying that we can have freedom, freedom from the things that have held us back, the things we can't seem to overcome. And we can learn to love, to love God and love others. God is inviting us into something new. As Jesse Sampson, our Gateway Buda campus pastor said this week, the problem is we are forgiven, but we're also forgetful. See, you might have come to a place where you began to follow Jesus and you even were baptized. You were washed clean of everything that came before. But the problem is every day we have a chance to go jump back into the mud. But the beautiful thing is God gives us the opportunity to find healing and forgiveness and to be clean once again every single day. And if you're watching and you're not yet a follower of Jesus or here in the room and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you should know you're being invited into a whole new way of living. The ways of God bring to life and freedom. See, steps four and five is actually learning this daily rebooting of our system. Have you ever had a problem with the Internet at your house? 
or with your computer or your phone. Don't you hate it when you call them up for help and they always ask the same thing? Have you turned it off? And you see, all you have to do is you've got to turn it off and then it's amazing when it reboots, the problem's fixed. This happened to me just this week. I called Kenny Martin, something's wrong with my computer. And he said, well, have you powered down in a while? I powered down and everything I had complained to complain about was fixed. See, steps four and five is our ways of spiritually rebooting that we may be able to move forward in a healthy way. Now, I have to be honest, we did a series similar to this about seven years ago. It's called Unchained. And I went through it and I experienced some, some changes in my life, but I didn't really do step four or step five. Then I went through this series on my own. Uh, I went through the steps on my own and I didn't really do step five. And so then I went through it all again. And it was on the third time through that I really did step four and I really did step five. It was on the other side of that that I experienced incredible transformation. It, it was like for the first time my head and my heart were connected. And it was on the fourth time through that I actually began to understand as I was trying to help other guys find the healing that I found. That's when I discovered the rhythm of working the steps. The John Burke referred to it as like learning the salsa dance. You can, you can hear how to do it, but until you get up, it, it may be awkward at first, but that's how you learn. You see, I, I don't know how to salsa dance, but I, I grew up in Texas and I know how to square dance. And even in college, I learned how to do the two-step. And in fact, I taught my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, how to do the jitterbug. I have proof of this. Here's a picture of us. I'm just about to throw her in the air. And then I throw her in the air. That's her feet, not mine. I'm throwing her. Her hair's coming over the back of my head. And it's what's amazing is once you get in the rhythm, you actually never forget it. One of the more difficult moves that we learned was called the pretzel. And during the virtual graduation that we did here at Gateway, I had a chance to dance once again with my wife. Here's proof. My wife, my daughter was not very impressed. I think eventually <laughs> it all comes right back. See, when you learn to, the rhythm of working the steps, anytime you're triggered, anytime you're hurting, the scriptures are filled with admonitions to slow down to reflect, to take an inventory of your life. Let's just look at a few of these passages. Lamentations 3 says this, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Jeremiah was warning his nation to turn to God because he alone could protect them. Take an account. Or oh, on this one, this beautiful Psalm 139. It's a prayer to God, which says this, search me God and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's part of this beautiful prayer that includes these words. Just listen to this. For God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Think about that. God thinks about you. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. He knows what's in your heart. Now you need to just take the time to examine your heart that you might know as well. And the beautiful thing is, when we begin going through step four and working this inventory, we're not doing it on our own. God is with us. If you've done step three, if you've entrusted your life, you surrendered to God's care, then you have nothing to fear in looking back at the past because you've experienced forgiveness. There's no fear of condemnation. Look what it says in Colossians 2. God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross, disarming the spiritual rulers and authority. See, when you go through the steps and you're in a group, you have God to guide you. You have others in your group to help you. See, but the problem is you and I, we cannot fix what we will not admit is broken. Consider what James Joyce said. Mistakes are the portals for discovery. 
See, taking the time, not beating yourself up, not heaping more guilt on yourself, but just becoming aware of patterns and habits and mistakes so that you can discover the way out, a new way. See, taking the inventory of your life is how you do it the first time through the steps. And then working the steps means every day you're taking inventory. Every day you're confessing to God and to one other. I like to do this on my own. I, I write in my journal every day and I try to think through the day. How did I treat others? What, what temptations tripped me up? And then I can see patterns and begin to find healing. So once you determine where you need to improve and what you want to overcome, that leads to step five, where you admit to God and to your, ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. See, confession is like removing toxins. The toxins in your soul are released through your mouth. As you confess to God and confess to one other person or even confess to the person that you've hurt, you don't need a priest. You just need a friend that's willing to listen. But don't be too proud to confess. Don't be too insecure to admit that you've made a mistake. Don't feel like you need to argue with others to prove your perfection. In fact, let me just, for a moment, just challenge you with a thought. If you have not confessed to God or another person, even in the last week, for something, then you're probably not taking a moral inventory. Because there's always something that we trip up on, but we can always start afresh. Listen to this quote from Charles M. Blow. Concealment makes the soul a swamp. Confession is how you drain it. See, so finding someone that you can trust and becoming someone that can be trusted. And if you're going through recovery, you have people who are trained and know how to do this. Honestly, I don't know how we would have made it through this difficult season if we hadn't had this community. And I know it's not exactly the way we want. Being online isn't our favorite, but I'm telling you, being online on Sundays and in a group is far better than wandering and drifting away. And for us, I have to tell you, when we first moved to Austin almost 10 years ago now, we loved how friendly everybody was. But what we soon discovered is that they're friendly from a distance. You have to be intentional. If you're waiting for your neighbors to invite you over, your coworkers to invite you over, don't wait, invite them. Be proactive. Jamie, our recovery pastor at Gateway in South Austin, came up with a great analogy. She was watching Animal Planet. And she was watching how predators pick out the weakest among the herd and they isolate it in order to pounce. But they don't go up against the entire herd because there's safety in numbers. See, too many of us have allowed ourselves to be isolated in this season. We need to lean into our faith and lean into community now more than ever. We encourage you to fully engage online. In fact, if you have kids, I know it's hard, but let me just encourage you, just make watching what's on gatewaychurch.com slash kids online with your kids, something you do together. And maybe they're big enough to watch with you the service. And if not, you can always watch on demand on our YouTube channel and just create your own little worship experience at any time, day or night. But we have opportunities for you to connect and it's not too late. We have something for everybody. We even have something new for college students starting this week. Just go to gatewaychurch.com slash south to find out how to be a part of that on Thursday nights. But now's the opportunity just jump in. Don't try to go through this all on your own. See, confession is a spiritual practice that requires a willingness to trust God and to trust others. It's a way of being courageous and vulnerable. That's how we find transformation. This is how every follower of Jesus should live. It's a whole new way of living. Those who are forgiven, learning to forgive more. So why are we so resistant to confession? I think it's because we already feel so guilty, already carry around with us so much shame, and we, refer, we fear rejection from God or from others. But it's only because we have a misunderstanding of God. Years ago, after I got married, I moved to Seattle with my wife. My 
brother got married. He moved to Boston with his wife. And so my mom was left here in Texas without us. And I remember her saying, you know, I always was reluctant to follow God because I, I knew he was going to make me become a missionary overseas. And because I didn't go overseas now, he sent my kids out of Texas. See, she's just saying out loud what some of us think, what I've thought. We have this misunderstanding with God that if I do all the right things, then he will protect me and everything will go exactly the way I want. When in reality, what we see in the scriptures is that we live in a broken world and things will go wrong. And there are a lot of things going wrong right now. But we are never alone in the midst of the suffering. I have to tell you during this season, as hard as it's been, and it's been really hard for our family in so many ways. But every morning I've had just this beautiful time with God. I mean, God is speaking to me in just so many remarkable ways and in such random books of the Bible, Haggai and Zechariah, Malachi. And as I'm reading through the scriptures, this last week I came upon the next book that I'm supposed to read and it's the book of Job. And honestly, I didn't want to read the book of Job. It's about the suffering of the innocent. It's about God's slowness to bring justice. And frankly, I didn't want to deal with all the injustice. I just want to read about how God does everything I ask him. That's what I want to read about. But I reluctantly stepped into the book of Job and it's been so beautiful to, to re be reminded that God is with us in the midst of our suffering. The guys from the Bible project summarize it best. They said this, God reminds Job that the world has order and beauty, but it is also wild and dangerous. While we do not always know why we suffer, we can bring our pain and grief to God and trust that he is wise and know, knows what he's doing. See, even when things are falling apart, God is with us. If we would just turn to him. And he can even bring good out of the midst of our suffering. St. Augustine once said, in failing to confess, Lord, I would only hide you from myself, not myself from you. Just starting with confession, God, I need you. Every day coming back to him, God, I failed you in this moment. But he also said, the confession of evil works is the be first beginning of good works. It just starts by acknowledging we need God's help, that we need his forgiveness. And doing that every day, rebuilding every day. What's beautiful as you look at the scriptures, there's lots of great reasons to confess. Here's this one, Psalm 32 says, then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not, and did not cover up my iniquity. I, will, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He removes the guilt and the shame that we carry around with us. Or this one we looked at earlier this year. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Every day throughout the day, we can reconnect with God. That's what it means to be fearless and vulnerable, not afraid, willing to go to God, willing to go to others. Or this one, Jeremiah 14, we can see the power of confession, not just for ourselves, but on behalf of others. We acknowledge our wickedness, Lord, and the guilt of our ancestors. We have indeed sinned against you. Over and over in the scriptures, we see People of faith confessing before God, not only for their own sins, but for the sins of their ancestors and their nation. And here's what's amazing. When they do that, God moves in a powerful way. They're not trying to pretend like everything's perfect, but they're being honest on behalf of their family, their generations before them, and even their nation. And God forgives, and he brings healing to move us forward. Or this one, James 5. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I was so nervous when I went through step four. I was so worried about what they might think about me. I was reluctant to share everything. But I can tell you at the end of that experience, I felt so free. It was like a weight had been lifted off of me. As I was going through this with others trying to help them along, I, I just wanted to share a, a, a brief excerpt of a conversation between Alan and Bob as they share their stories of working through these steps. Let's watch together. Well, as uh, Eric said, uh, my name is Alan and I've been in the uh, recovery uh, group for, for a while now. And I was recalling about when I did my fifth step and how uh, I was preparing my moral inventory in step four. 
and just recalling how difficult of a process uh, that was because there was a lot of things on my inventory that um, I really didn't want to pull up and, and confront. And so, uh, and of course there was, there was good things on my inventory list, like my wife and my daughters and, and all the joy that came uh, as a result of that. But there was many things that, you know, I just really didn't want to tackle. And it was uh, things on my inventory that you know, centered around stuff that was um, scary or painful and uncomfortable. And um, I just really didn't want to tackle that. But what was really meaningful about, about that whole process was that I was able to see how all of these things are just interconnected with, with one another. And just to see how they, they relate to um, present day situations. And so with something that's coming up now in my life, something that shouldn't be a big, big deal at all, all of a sudden now is a very big deal and I'm feeling triggered and it's um, causing all kinds of feelings of anxiety and anger and depression. And so I'm able to see how each one of these things um, are related to each other now that I've done an honest assessment of the things that are there in my past and, you know, being able to uh, tackle that um, has led me to um, moments where I could see how those items are touching other moments on my inventory, which was moments where I just felt like um, I just wasn't good enough, or it was moments that made me feel like I was unlovable. And so as these situations come up now, now that I've done my inventory and I've learned these 12 steps, uh, instead of going to unhealthy ways of dealing and coping with that, I can really use the uh, steps to help me in these situations. And it's just led uh, to a life uh, that it's just been greater amounts of joy and peace in my life. And, you know, I still have moments that come up, but the level of peace that I have now is it's truly the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I really wanted other people to have that same opportunity uh, that I did. And so I, I fully embraced step 12 and um, that first group that I was helping to facilitate, you know, you were, in, you were in that class and it was just amazing to see the uh, transformation um, that you had throughout the course and along with the other guys. But um, do you wanna, uh, Bob, do you wanna take a, a moment and tell us um, kind of what was um, difficult about the fifth step and then what was meaningful uh, about doing the fifth step? Sure, uh, my name's Bob, like Alan was saying. I think the most difficult part of this was the actual one-on-one, -on -one, uh, because Alan was the one that I went to go and uh, talk to for the fifth step. And I think what ended up happening with that is um, I had done okay with revealing things to God because I knew he already knew those things. And so it wasn't like some big secret that I was going to reveal to him. On the other hand, contrast that with having to go and speak to Alan, uh, I was coming to you, uh, even though we had already built a relationship in the group over, you know, previous weeks, I wasn't sure that once I exposed all of my deepest, darkest secrets, that, uh, that Alan would want anything to do with me. So, in going in, um, I pleasantly found out that uh, as I started talking to Alan, very, uh, 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 let's just say conservatively at first, but then as I started to feel more comfortable, I started feeling um, God's grace from him. And I started realizing that he wasn't, um, he wasn't judging me. And he was, you were listening as, as a brother in Christ. And that meant a lot to me. And as Alan will recall, uh, it started the floodgates to open. Um, as I was telling him, I was probably willing to share about 70%, and that soon went to 80%, went to 90%, and it got to the point where uh, I'm sure he was ready for me to stop. But uh, this was my opportunity to uh, get all of that out. And I'm thankful that God put uh, Alan in my pathway so that I could actually start my road to recovery and 
and start dealing with uh, not only taking responsibility for the things that I have done and the hurts that I've caused others, but on top of that, being able to now um, go back, forgive others, and in turn forgive myself. And uh, in doing so, I knew that the next step, as far as I was concerned, would be to help others that had been in the same situation that I had been. Let me just ask you, are you tired? Let someone else carry that burden with you. Are you exhausted? Don't try to do this all on your own. Lean into faith, lean into community. Maybe you've wandered away. Allow someone to help reconnect you to faith and to community. The scriptures say, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Maybe your next step is trying to help someone in their journey. If that's you, be gentle. Don't get cocky. Help them. And finally, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't give up. This too shall pass. Things will get better. This pandemic will one day end. And God is with us through this entire time. And you see, God's silence doesn't mean that he's not with us. During this final song, I want you to reconnect your heart to God and even consider what next step he might have for you to live out the kind of life that he's called us to live. Let gratitude be what motivates you to take that next step, to be the, become the kind of person that God's called you to be. Reconnect with God as we listen to this. Okay. 